people of God, hear these words from the prophet Micah for you, God's people. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and many peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he will judge between many peoples and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. Then they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Everyone will sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree, and no one will make them afraid. For the Lord Almighty has spoken. All the nations may walk in the name of their gods, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. God, we pray that you would plant these words like a seed in our heart by the miracle of your grace. You would grow something real and living and abundant and fruitful for your people through us. Amen. Friends, I used to think the Bible was full of a million different stories. I used to think that the Bible was full of a million different truths for a million different occasions and reasons, and all were true, and they were all jumbled up together. And now I believe, after all these years, I'm beginning to see that our scripture is one story, one meta narrative. And it weaves all the truth that is into one cohesive story and us into that story. One word, and it is embodied in the resurrected Jesus, who is the word of God. And all the law and all the prophets and all the writings and the gospels and the letters and the revelation lead us to the way of Christ, which is the way of salvation. And when we begin to read the Bible as one story, we start to see the stark contrast between our ways, our fallen human way and the way of the Lord. And one way to express this sacred truth of everything, everywhere, all at once, one way to do a synopsis of that grand narrative story is that the story of the Bible is the story of the way of the kingdom of God in Christ and the ways of the empires we make in this world. Empire versus kingdom. The empire way is our way, the human way, based on our corrupted, fallen understanding. It appears good. It seems, frankly, necessary. It looks like the only way to survive. And the way of the kingdom, that is God's way. It's the way of heaven, and it's beyond our understanding and it's yet full of the spirit and led by the spirit. The kingdom of God is in our midst, even now, partially and powerfully. Even now, when we pray the Jesus prayer, we say your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What we're saying is deliver us from the false and evil way of the empire. Lead us not into the temptation of doing what seems best and prudent and necessary in our eyes. Not our will, but your will be done. 
The whole witness of scripture is the battle between these two ways, the way of the empire and the way of the kingdom, the way that seems like the road to life, but isn't. And the way that seems like a path to losing everything, but doesn't. One story in scripture and Genesis is the prequel, the prologue, but it begins in Exodus when a people who are helplessly and hopelessly enslaved by the most powerful empire of the day, the Egyptian empire, they are forced to work themselves to death, even by law to kill their infant sons. And those people who have no God are powerfully and gloriously rescued by the God of all creation. And they are given a land that was promised to their ancestor, Abram, and they had forgotten, but God had not. But once they were rescued, they did not go straight through to the land of milk and honey, but they had to wander for a generation in the wilderness, in the wild place where they were led by the hand by God and they drank water from rocks and they ate the miracle bread of heaven and learned that nothing is as it seems. These ones who used to be slaves, who knew only how to produce for others, for generation practiced receiving life straight from the hand of God. Getting from God what they could not get for themselves. And in that wilderness time, they began the scary and sacred work of unlearning everything they knew for sure. And they were given the Torah, the ways of God, and instructed how to live by faith, that every aspect of their life was sacred before God and not just what happens in the temple. And there wasn't going to be one anyway, because God would ever and always tabernacle with them, would pitch a tent in the middle of wherever they were and live in the midst of their whole lives. They were given the Torah, God's ways to live by God's abundance and not by human fear and striving. They were given from God the wisdom of how to truly be human by embracing our limits and God-given vulnerability. They were given by God in the Torah ways to live as salt and light to the whole earth and how to lose power, to care for the powerless, how to welcome the stranger, how to reconcile and restore, how to rest and how to have enough. And the people came into the promised land, swearing to serve God and live by God's ways forever. And within a generation, it was, God, we love you. You're perfect. Never change, but also not your ways, but our ways, because there's slightly improvements on your ways, because we want to be a real nation like all the others. So God, we know you said no king, but we want kings. And we know you said no temple, but we want to build a big one for you, God. Help us help you, God. And we know that you said that you would protect us when that you rescued us from the Egyptian army. But like, we need a real army now or else how can we feel safe? And God's kept sending the prophets to the people to call them back to the kingdom of heaven ways, back to the ways of daily bread from God and neighbor love and tabernacle God in the middle of your life. And the people kept turning their, closing their ears and turning their eyes towards the ways of everyone else and turning away from God and putting their faith in kings and temples and armies. And so by the time the troublemaking prophet Micah comes along in the 8th century BCE. He's raised up by God and he begins the scroll which bears his name by crying out against the kings and false prophets who were turning Israel from the kingdom of salt and light through whom all nations would be blessed into a holy empire which would do big things for God, but nothing through God. God raised up the prophet Micah to cry cry out against kings and prophets who claimed God's name, but forsaked God's ways, who used the people for their power instead of their power for the people. And because we humans inevitably become what we worship, because we get what we believe in, now the people who believed in the way of empire are about to be destroyed by one. God raises up the prophet Micah. And in the passage that we read today, the prophet Micah has come to the throne room of King Hezekiah in the capital city of Samaria. And the king of Assyria is laying siege at the gate. 
Sennacherib is laying siege at the gate and there is no way out. And what lies ahead of the people of God is pitiless destruction at the hand of their enemies. And the prophet comes into the throne room of the kings who led the people away from God. And he comes to say, not I told you so. The prophet comes to speak a holy word of salvation and to offer them a sacred weapon they can use to resist the merciless enemy, to give them a vision, which is the only way to fight the army that lies before them and within them. On the day when the mightiest nation on earth and its chattel slaves are marching toward the city with their weapons raised under orders to starve the city out and then destroy it. On a day when the people know that if they survive the siege at all, they will be led away in chains and marched to wherever the emperor wills. On that day, the prophet comes to them with a vision of the last days, which still lie before them. The day of the Lord. And the prophet says, on that day, people will be walking, but not in chains and not in battalions. The people will be walking by choice to Mount Zion, not to plunder or destroy, but to seek in freedom, truth, and to find justice, knowing they will receive it there. Because the temple of God has been raised up, not in elevation, but in honor. It's the God of the house of Jacob, Jacob, the one who is the father of all who struggle and resist and grasp for everything they desire. His God is teaching the ways of his kingdom, teaching even ones and especially ones like Jacob, how to walk in God's paths, paths of righteousness and justice and equity. And all nations are seeing what is happening there. And they are walking to Jerusalem to learn how to walk in the ways of the kingdom of God. They are driven not by desperation, but by desire. And out of Jerusalem comes truth and justice for all the nations in the last days. And strong nations begin to settle their disputes by faith. And the prophet tells the kings and the leaders who sought to settle disputes and protect and provide for themselves by the sword that a day is coming when no nation will live by war but through faith in God's justice. While the besieging army is at the gate, Micah gives them vision of a new era where nobody trains for war anymore. Every empire promises peace. Every empire claims it will make peace by their power to make war. That peace comes through redemptive and justified violence. They will make peace and they will give peace after they achieve victory. And Israel played that game like all the nations before and since. And now at that moment, they see that the game has destroyed them. They've lost. And now their ears are open to hear what God has always told them. That the way of the kingdom, peace comes not through victory over your enemies. Peace comes through flourishing peace comes not when you destroy your enemy but when you see your enemy is your neighbor and everyone has enough the peace in the last days of the kingdom of God comes not because God's people have mastered the art of making war for God but because every person every person all people sit in the shade of their own vine And rest under their own fig tree. They sit and rest because they know no one can make them afraid. Security and peace through abundance. And in those days, Micah tells them the war cry of every empire. The cry that kings use to call citizens out of the vineyards and into the battlefields. The cry that turns farmers into soldiers. And you find this cry in in historical documents throughout the nations of the ancient Middle Near East. It's this biblical version of the remember the Alamo, right? This battle cry throughout the nations is prepare for war. Stir up, you mighty men. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. 
That's how the leaders of empires call their people into war. In the empire, at any moment, you must be willing to go to war to keep the peace. But in the kingdom of God, all of that is reversed. And the people choose to beat their swords into plowshares, to melt down their spears into pruning hooks, to turn their weapons into gardening tools and their bombs back into fertilizer, to repurpose the tools of violence into tools to create nourishment because they're not afraid of anything. So they don't need weapons. God says, there will never be peace on earth until the day of the Lord. Until the day my people realize that no matter how powerful they are, they will not have peace until their neighbor has peace. They will not have enough until their enemy has enough. That's how it was in the beginning, how it is in the kingdom and how it ever shall be. It's shalom. The day of the Lord where there is once again, mutual interdependent flourishing of every created thing. And the Abrahamic covenant is fulfilled and all nations are blessed through this nation of Israel. And those are the words that the prophet speaks to the people of God. They are called to be the kingdom of heaven on earth and the fears that they live with and the desires that they have and we have have led them to become like every other nation. One more empire fighting in the name of its God and the prophet comes into them in the days before their destruction and gives them a vision. And then in verse five, a call to return to God. The prophet says to them, other nations are always going to walk in the names of their gods, but we walk in the name of our God. With the enemy at the gate, the prophet gives them this impossibly beautiful vision and with it a call to walk it out. Because in the Hebrew Bible, people aren't called to believe in God. They are called again and again to walk in the ways of the Lord, to walk in the paths of God to walk in the paths of righteousness and justice and humility and repentance and repair and kindness and generosity and vulnerability and truth. In the Hebrew Bible, you're not called to believe the truth. You're called to walk in the truth you believe. As they are about to be destroyed by the ascendant empire of the day, the prophet reminds them that they were called and ever and always will be a kingdom whose king is God and no other. And their God king calls them to walk in his ways, the ways of shalom and seeking the good of your neighbor and putting your trust in God and not in the power of violence. And once you look for it in this passage, there's a whole lot of talk about walking in this vision. There's a lot of talk about walking and paths. Empires don't make paths. Empires make roads. We celebrate the Roman empire to this day because they made roads that still stand. Roads are made by force and money and power. And a road takes you from one place to the place where the people who made the road decide you need to be. A road will only take you to the place the road leads according to the whim and wisdom of the one laying the road down for everybody. But paths are different. Paths are made by people who leave the roads, who leave the roads because the see, they see the roads won't take them to the place they want to go. Paths are made by walking. And one person can't make a path. It takes many people walking together to make a path, many people walking together and deciding to move in a way that no one has moved before, deciding to go not where the powers and principalities and authorities say they must or say they should. On the edge of destruction, the prophet gives the people a vision, a vision of what God can do and will do, and then asks them to walk in the way of that vision their own feet, trusting the power of the liberating spirit of God, the prophet says, here's the vision, make the path. Beloved, the witness of scripture is clear. We become what we worship. There's power in the spiritual realm. 
And if we believe in war and violence and power, we will be consumed by our beliefs. But if we believe in peace and forgiveness and reconciliation and shalom and neighbor enemy love, then we will be transformed by our beliefs. Church, the question isn't which way we agree with. The question isn't which way we prefer the way of the kingdom or the way of the empire, the way of war or the way of shalom. The question isn't what we believe in. The question is what way we walk in. The question is, what do you trust God with? Many of us trust God with our eternity, because what else are you going to do? And many of us trust God with the small, least important things in our lives. But when it comes to what's in the middle, to what is truly high stakes, our safety and our future and our prosperity, we keep walking on the empire's roads. Because we believe in a world where weapons are turned into gardening tools, but somebody else has got to go first because we need to be able to keep our weapons to protect ourselves. And we believe in stopping to take care of the beaten up guy on the side of the road, but somebody else should do that because we have to be practical and protect ourselves and we live in the real world. And if we do that, we might get jumped. We believe that money doesn't define us and provide worth and security, but still, When it comes down to it, we need to earn as much as we can because that's how we protect ourselves and that's how we provide for ourselves and that's how we provide for God's kingdom. At the end of the day, we believe that you need a mighty army to protect God's temple. And true, God never asked us to build him a temple, but we built it for him anyway. But the truth is many of us, me included, we we trust God with the very top of our lives eternity and the very bottom of our lives, the things that are low stakes, but the middle, the vast, messy middle where the real life practical decisions get made, the important stuff. We feel like we got to do what's best in our eyes and not take a risk on faith. Church, a time comes when every one of us needs to decide, are we going to put our trust in the ways of this world? Are we going to travel on the wide, smooth, paved, and clearly marked road that is laid down before us? Are we going to armor up and say we're doing it for God? Or are we going to vulnerably and foolishly seek to walk in God's vision? Are we going to seek out and co-create the paths of God's righteousness and trust and faith and goodness? Are we going to surrender to God because we're wise enough to know that the other way leads to destruction? Friends, there comes a time where we have to decide, are we going to make choices, reasonable choices to try and protect ourselves and our faith? Or are we going to make choices to practice our faith? Protect our faith or practice our faith. How do we walk in faith in times of great threat? The prophet gives us a vision and an invitation to walk in that vision, to make a path together through the power of the spirit. Come, let us walk in the ways of the Lord.